Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Vaitreith. I'm delighted to be starting the... Sorry, I've got some feedback. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, try that again. Uh, we're delighted to be hosting uh, Dr. Alan Lee, who's here from the NASA Laboratory for Advanced Sensing in Silicon Valley. Uh, Alan is a longtime collaborator. We actually went to graduate school together at Stanford. He finished his PhD there in 2016 in aeronautics and astronautics. And prior to that, he did uh, his degree, undergraduate degree in mechatronics from University of Waterloo in Canada. And he is also a classically trained pianist, among <laughs> other things. So I'm going to uh, let Alan take it away. You should at least listen to him playing Rachmaninoff. It is uh, as beautiful as the architecture of his Nemo net. Uh, neural network. He's the co-investigator on multiple NASA grants, um, helps develop MIDAR, um, one of the inventions of the year for NASA, as well as uh, NEMONET, uh, which we'll be talking about today. And I'm just very delighted that he's uh, come out to visit us here in Miami. So, All right. Thank you for uh, the wonderful introduction, uh, Professor Chariot, I should say now. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about today uh, about NemoNet in particular and, and the gamifying and automating of uh, marine mapping using citizen science and uh, neural networks. So I've been at NASA for, I started in 2016. So it's been five years and, and a bit now. So during that time, you know, uh, when, I was, uh, when I first came to NASA, I was brought in to look at, try to take the technologies that we had back in the day, like in, in machine learning particularly, and try to update them uh, so that we could sift through all the data that NASA has. And eventually it morphed into, uh, from SVNs into CNNs, and which I'll be all talking about later. But anyway, without further ado, uh, let me get started here. So I think everybody here, I'm pre presenting I'm Rasmus, we all know why we need to protect the reefs. and. Um, and you probably all know more about this, much more than I do as, uh, as a computer scientist slash, uh, yeah, sort of engineer in this field. So as you can see, you know, coral bleaching is, is a big problem. And um, just because of climate change, all of the uh, human factors that's going on, and needless to say, uh, these habitats are, are not thriving, basically, uh, at this time. And so what we are doing at NemoNet is trying to come up with a way to track, monitor, uh, assess these systems using automated methods, uh, given the data from you know, drones and satellites and so forth. I'll spend time on this. So here, uh, hopefully the video shows on the Zoom as well as uh, here on the video, but uh, essentially what we are using is an instrument called FluidCam. What it does is it removes the fluid distortions from the surface of the water so you can get a much clearer uh, high resolution uh, picture underneath about one centimeter in scale and what we're trying to build is something like this a uh, bathymetric map uh, using that data but also a classification map uh, so you can see like what is coral what is not and separate into the mounding corals and uh, branching corals and uh, different morphologies as well so this i believe was from american samoa one of our first uh, test sets in this area Actually, the error was very low for this, uh, uh, but it was only on a sort of a small piece uh, within that island, uh, around that region, rather. You can see rocks and uh, the corals here being classified. And I believe this might have been using one of our first earlier machine learning methods, map estimation on uh, XML uh, posterior. So what are the NemoNet goals? Um, so there are five main goals. We want to create a fused global data set of coral reefs from fluid cam, airborne, and satellite data. So fuse, fuse them as in from all uh, different spatial resolutions and different um, spectral sets. So we want to develop also uh, coral-specific remote sensing uh, deep learning methods. Um, I'm sure you all have heard about the amazing things that uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning is doing these days. And we really want to leverage that to see how it can benefit Earth science. Um, we want to globally assess the present and past dynamics of coral reef systems using these uh, these methods, and uh, train NemoNet and uh, using uh, active learning methods. So, as everyone knows, you know machine learning it's uh, it's just as it's only as good as the data that you feed it, right? So if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So how how can we build a system where we can uh, we can improve the rate at which you're confident about the 
the classifications that people are making for us uh, in citizen science. And finally, deploy NeoNet as sort of an open source product. Uh, we partnered with NASA Next to build it up to uh, on a supercomputing platform and make it available. So, okay. So this is the general uh, NeoNet sort of high level overview of all the myriad of components here. Um, so uh, at the meat of the, the project is in here on the right hand side, actually, uh, I spend most of my time here uh, in the bottom right, which is the Python package and the CNN algorithm. Uh, my colleague Jared was uh, responsible for the active learning problem, uh, sorry, platform, and he developed most of the app. And I'll talk only a little bit about the raw data and the data preparation as, as we are getting it from FluidCam and, uh, and other satellites. So first of all, I'll just talk a little bit about the raw data and what we have available to us right now. So this is a comparison of the different scales and the different data sets that uh, uh, we originally had access to. And there's a few more as well. Uh, I didn't list them all, but you can see the, the, the differences, right? So we get a very crisp picture here, RGB, one centimeter for airborne fluid lensing. Um, this is, you know, we're flying. I don't know, 50 feet above the, the corals themselves. You can see, yeah, it's, it's a very clear picture. But as you go higher and higher up, you know, especially up to the satellite level, um, things get a lot blurrier, a lot more difficult to make out, right? You might have more spectral, uh, you know, Worldview has eight spectral bands when you get up here, but still it, it makes the problem, the problem is not easy, right? So going from this to this. So one of the questions that we want to ask is, well, is there a way that we can transition using uh, information that we get at the centimeter scale or even you know 30 centimeter scale um, up to the two meter scale and there are other satellites down here you know landsat i didn't show that are even more, you know 10 meter to 30 meter scale well how can we transition those resolutions uh, and use that the information from let's say worldview into into something like sentinel as well So this is again something uh, on uh, on the data sources that Neonet is using currently. So you know underwater AUV, this is uh, you can get uh, very precise, but you can't you can't really go all over the globe uh, or survey all the all over the globe at once with with, with something like UAV or fluid cam. Even you know you can get maybe on a sort of island level once you get to fluid cam. Uh, over a few days, of course, um, for fluid cam and aerial imagery. And then we go into the satellites, which, you know, with their uh, orbital parameters, and you, you get much better coverage. Uh, you can see large swaths over a larger uh, temporal extent, basically. And then this is where QuickBird was the first one launched. Uh, and then what we are primarily working with with Worldview. Uh, and Sentinel. And also there's the new and upcoming, uh, uh, the new data sets that uh, are available also uh, as planet, which is around four meters, I believe, in resolution, four meters-ish. So again, I kind of made a comparison on the bottom of what you kind of expect to see as you go from MIDAR, which is an instrument that we did. This is actually underwater all the way up to something like Worldview. All right. So next up, I would like to talk a little bit about the data preparation side of it and how we're cleaning up our data and kind of uh, segmenting it so that it's available to uh, to people for people to classify. And this is also going to be a little short, but the general overview is like this: the incoming raw data that uh, we've been working with, you know, raw digital numbers and so forth, goes through radiometric, a light radiometric calibration. Correction, there's some masking done, you know, for deep water, things like that, where we know there's obviously nothing around. Um, and then it goes into this library here. It's a little more uh, detail into the code, I suppose. But um, what, what we basically do is actually we split the images into, you know, 5 by 512 by 12, 512 to give the user context. We ask them to classify the middle 256 by 256. And so this is uh, what, what this kind of library does. It separates all of them. If you have label data, it will uh, form the label data along with the satellite imagery. 
itself, uh, you normalize the data, you, com you convert it into the classes you want or you want the people to classify in. And then, uh, and then what we do is uh, we, we prepare it by randomizing it. So we, so over you know, one particular island, we might take random sections where we know they are coral and then basically farm it out to, onto the app, which I'll later talk about. You generate the data. So you, that's the data generation part. You export these image blocks. Uh, you export the segmentation truth map if you have it. Most of the time you do not because uh, you know you're asking people to classify, and this is and this kind of goes into these four blocks: the training, the uh, image data, the label data, the validation image, and validation data, the label data. I should say there's a, another set, you know, the test set data as well, um, which I haven't included here. And from the app and the users, they feed mostly to the label data, training data, label data, validation label data. Uh, and eventually all of this goes to the CNN. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the active learning platform. This is primarily the work of my colleague, uh, Jared Mandenberg. Um, so the idea is, uh, it's like we're trying to use uh, citizen science to capture uh, the classifications for us. You know, it's, it's very hard in machine learning to get good data sets, and it's always a challenge all the time. So our method was to develop an app. It's actually an educational app as well. It doubles as that. And it, it, you'll see that it's kind of like just a painting application. People can go in, you know, have fun. And, but also it's, if you're a scientist, you can also use it to actually train the coral or like uh, segment the corals uh, because you probably know more about what you're doing than uh, the layman out there. So the general overview, of the AnemoNet app is structured like this. You have the in situ, so it supports two, uh, I say, sort of uh, large classes of uh, classifications. Sorry. Um, you, the photography that we have, which is it's fully 3D capable, as well as the satellite imagery, which is 2D. So 3D is a little bit more challenging to, I would say, to classify, but you do get a lot more sense of what the coral you know, the rugosity and all the 3D characteristics of it, as you can see in the second image. Um, so the input data comes in, uh, you have your, you know, your player base, which is citizen science and uh, subject matter experts. And it goes here into the game, uh, which is all hosted on servers. That chunks I was talking about, the 512 by 512, where they classify the middle 256 by 256. Uh, uh, we add a number of features like in-game tutorial, there's a review mode, uh, class Location mode, which is where you're just kind of airbrushing on top of the corals in different colors, as you see here, and also a 3D uh, coral field guide, and this is most for the educational outreach component of it. Um, yeah, and then, like I said, the training uh, data set and the validation data set, as you saw in the data set preparation slide, that's where these go, which feeds eventually into the CNN, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so when you go into the game, this is kind of what you see. You're on a boat, a uh, pretty large boat. Um, and our game developer added a few, you know, Easter eggs that he's very proud of. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, so what, on, on the beginning where you said you dive in, you classify coral, that's kind of where everything gets started. And there's perks and badges, you know, all the game related material that uh, people like nowadays. If you go and go to the classify coral, this is what you get if you go into the 3D section. So you can really see uh, uh, this is reconstructed from the point clouds. You can really see uh, the shape of the coral, like uh, the myrids, even the tinier features, you know, the, um, the barbs even. Uh, so, so it actually gives you a really good sense of um, what you would expect to see in the field. And this is, you know, you can project it to VR and AR and all of that uh, more fanciful stuff, but there it is. And this is the actual painting sort of process, right? This is just the entry level. So there's only two classes, there's only coral or other or sediment. So your user comes in and you really, you know, you have to go around the coral, you have to uh, pan around it, uh, look at it from all angles to, to kind of paint over what you think it is. On the bottom right hand, if we have the truth map, uh, from expert classification, I'll tell you how much you have accurately um, processed here on the right hand side. You know, as you level up, you have all these different kinds of uh, 
animals that you can unlock. And I think they are also like float around inside the game themselves. Oh, the game itself is um, built in Unity, I should add. And uh, you know, you size a clownfish and you can become a, either get a shark or a stingray or what have you. And you know, you can get even into more complicated classes, although this is more for the sort of expert uh, classification uh, available. And this is the field guide. Uh, so this is mostly added to sort of add an educational outreach component to the game itself. So I think it's been translated into six languages, six plus languages that I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, this, I, I think we've tested this also in the classroom, you know, we went to uh, I think it's third graders and, <laughs> and uh, they, they had a blast. Uh, uh, learning about this, and we've been contacted by uh, educational curricula um, to kind of uh, when when they're learning about coral, and uh, this is a kind of a classroom feature and a nice to have. This is the review mode that we've added. Um, so this is this is now starting to get into how we're going to separate you know the good classifications from the bad. Um, you can imagine when you're dealing with things like citizen science people. Sometimes they just like to doodle, you know, so they'll draw random shapes and such. And this review mode lets you review other people's work. So you just give a thumb up, a thumb down. It's very simple, straightforward. If you add like star ratings, people get, you know, the less complex, the better usually when you when you get into these things. Um, so actually, this is a very good tell on how it's a, actually a very good first sort of filter for uh, how good you can expect the classification to be. And I should say that this this active learning component for areas uh, that you're uncertain about, or the CNN is uncertain about, or classifications that are, there's a lot of uh, error, or something doesn't quite match up. Maybe the standard deviation is way off. Um, you can farm it out again and um, and put it back into the system for other others to classify until hopefully you get a a solidified result or a convergent result. So the player. This is a short video. So every player basically submits their applications. They go or classifications, and it goes to the server here. And at the server level, it matches up each. Uh, this is satellite data. It matches each person's classifications. And these are real classifications made by real people, by the way. So you can see how different they are. Uh, one of the challenges is that everybody has kind of a different opinion on how big a cloud should be or whatnot. But mostly, mostly I would say it's pretty good at getting. Uh, things that are blatantly obvious as the uh, human eye can see it. And this is kind of uh, this is the heat map of uh, all the classifications put together over multiple people. And you can see it does a pretty good job. Most people are, are in agreement with each other. It's actually also acts as, acts as a pretty good boundary detector for uh, for areas that uh, uh, you know, as they classify algae versus uh, coral here. So, so just using this, you, you can see that as long as you keep the sort of classes simple, straightforward, um, uh, generally users do a pretty good job about uh, uh, about uh, classifying what, what they believe is one class or the other. So, here I've listed also the, the classification filter, particularly the rating filter. So as I said before, the filter, the rating filter is kind of the first step to go to to tell if, uh, if a certain classification is you know, reasonable or not. And generally, as you can see, including the rating filter, uh, your, your recall in this case tends to go up, except for maybe Hawaii in 2D for some reason. I think the Hawaii data set that we have is particularly challenging and it doesn't, uh, it's very hard to tell what anything is. Uh, and this is actually only for sort of the expert classifications here. Uh, but you can see that's when, when you switch to 3D that uh, there's a huge jump in recall as well. Uh, but maybe like also we don't have as much 3D uh, process going into uh, the, the Hawaii data set. And of course, uh, the satellite 2D data set as well. So generally you get uh, probably around the, you know, Here's the, I have the numbers here, 20% to like 40% uh, classification increase uh, in accuracy and recall uh, if you use the classification filter or at least the rating filter. 
So a quick picture of all the classifications that we've uh, collected so far and kind of all the users, the user statistics that uh, we've been collecting. So here we have standard deviation. This is based upon the truth data um, uh, compared to truth expertly classified truth data that we have uh, by scientists, a number of classifications, uh, their accuracy. So you can see there's a whole bunch of people that you know only classify one thing and went away. Um, it's kind of well, what you'd expect for an, an app, you know, when you, when you put it online. But I want to bring your attention to here that there are some people that you know classify thousands of uh, <laughs> images right here, and their accuracy is uh, is not bad. It's around you know seventy percent, and the accuracy is based upon random. Um, expert classified, they don't know which trans sites have been expertly classified, by the way, so it's a blind test, right? Um, yeah, so around here is kind of where we're focusing our sort of uh, user base, yeah, high accuracy, the standard deviation, at least a little bit lower, so it's not all over the place. And uh, yeah, and high people that tend to classify a lot tend to become much better at it, rather than people that just classify a few. So this can be also another tell about which classifications to co and trust. And this is the uh, confusion matrix of all the classifications here. There, there's a lot of them, and the star asterisk ones are, um, are satellite only. So, so you can see the precision overall. It's, if you average over all of them, it's yeah 57% because it is probably to the general public. So you really have to kind of filter and put everything through you know the classification filter and uh, and the chart I just showed previously to get a good picture to get classifications at least that you can set my trust. And so some statistics, sorry, statistics about uh, where it's been downloaded the most, and it's received quite a, a um, uh, good rating actually online, and it's, uh, it's well received, I would say, at the very least. Um, we've got a time here. So now I'll dig into sort of where my work probably focuses on, uh, which is the Python, uh, the CNN package. So a machine learning. I don't want to turn this into a uh, purely you know, machine learning uh, overview. I'll just only give a brief overview of what you know machine learning is. Uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about it like uh, these days as well. It's kind of very hard to avoid. The process for CN, the NemoNet CNN is at least this. So we go through pre-processing. It's a little. This is a little repeated from what I was talking about: the radiometric calibration and you know the segmentation of the data and so forth. And then we really get into the the meat and potatoes of the of the CNN itself, which I'll go into the structure architecture. And finally, we have post-processing, which cleans up the data coming out of the or sorry, the classification coming out of the CNN, as it were. And here is where you know it goes to the app platform. To get trained and then it comes back in to train the CNN. So pre-processing, I uh, won't spend too much time on this either. So it's uh, very similar to what I presented earlier, way back uh, a few slides about you know it coming in and uh, digital numbers uh, to convert the top of the atmosphere radiance, do some solar angle correction. It's very lightly calibrated uh, because we want sort of the human eye to be able to see engage just a general uh, where the corals are. They we're not trying to get sort of family level information from, you know, um, from satellite data, say. So we go through data augmentation. So we go through spectral randomization, uh, image modification. So we don't collect, usually machine learning needs, you know, millions of samples or such to actually do a good job. So we don't have millions of samples or really good millions of samples anyway. So what we do is go through uh, uh, classifications that we quite uh, that we trust from uh, scientists and so forth that we know, and we we take them, we augment them by flipping the images, rotating them, adding the spectral noise, uh, randomization. So you can come up with tens of thousands of new images just from uh, a, a small a small set. These are just some examples of four different people classify the same image over here. And you can see how different they are, but they get the the big pieces sort of sort of correct. It goes to, uh, and then this eventually feeds into the CNN. So I'll give a brief overview of the CNN here. So a CNN is uh, short for a convolutional neural network. So it, it's particularly good at um, classifying images. And here, you know, you want to classify a car, 
how does it work? It only at its basic, the most basic uh, CNNs only go by sort of this like general algorithm, which is you know if it's a linear uh, equation uh, with an activation function. And the fact that activation function is actually usually we use something like ReLU, which is linear anyway, just for backpropagation and uh, training purposes, so it can uh, converge quicker. Um, so you can see there's like three sort of layers here. This is usually RGB, so for an image like that. And when, when you apply this equation, WTX plus B, it gets on the three by three pixel here, the W, you know, it might be a three by three. It basically shrinks it down into sort of one pixel here. And then you slide this window across, and this is how you get one, one sort of frame, as it were, uh, on your next layer. And then you can do this again, right? You might want multiple features. So you will do this again, and then you get a second slice and then third slice. And usually, as you move forward into the CNN, um, you get more and more sizes, usually 64, 128, 256, you know, um, kind of the standard uh, for memory issues. And at the end, you, you, you have a uh, fully connected layer, which just shrinks all the, all, all the features that you have here and connects everything to everything else. Uh, so what does this do uh, oh, generally? So the features get more and more abstract as you go down uh, further and further into the CNN cell. So, you know, you might start, if you're trying to classify a face, you might start off with something like, you know, detecting a line, all right? After you detect the line, you combine these lines to form, form contours. After you form, form contours, you form shapes, and then so forth and so forth until the shape is recognizable. And then you give a probability distribution at the end, which uh, classifies uh, it's to the classes that you're interested in. Uh, and as they get more and more abstract, you can see that you lose uh, spatial resolution as well. You know, the images are getting smaller and smaller, but what you do get is you get feature information. You know where a feature has kind of appeared uh, and if it exists within the picture originally. So some CNN terms, pooling, it's just the downsampling you know, going from 256 uh, by 256, let's say from the first uh, image down to probably 16 by 16 in the last one. Uh, flattening, you're converting this uh, this block here into a, into an array in a 1D vector. Batch normalization is just a method in which you normalize against uh, a particular layer, layer. If there's outliers and such, you can take out. Um, uh, it's just a normalization procedure. Okay. So, that was all well and good CNNs for classifying if this is a car, Jeep, whatever, a truck, you know, specific classes. But what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to segment the image into different classes, right? So we need to bring it back to the resolution that we originally had. And this is a, this is a particular famous uh, CNN structure known as the VGG16 uh, or UNET. Uh, I believe it's first development on 2015, 2016, maybe even a little earlier. But uh, what it does is the, the first part of it is uh, exactly the same um, as what I described earlier. You know, you downsample, you get into uh, many, many features. But you also have an upsampling portion as well to get from the 16 by 16 back to the, let's say, 256 by 256 of your original image. Um, through this upsampling procedure, you also combine uh, these uh, bridge sort of um, connections here so that the resolution that you originally had is not completely lost. Remember, you lost resolution here, but you gained features. And going the other way, you need to gain resolution, but uh, come, start combining the features together to form uh, the, uh, the segmentation classes that you see here at the end. And this is the NemoNet CNN, which is a little bit more complicated uh, <laughs> in all its glory. And you can see the same structure uh, happening here. You have the, you know, uh, feature extraction block on the top. This is something called the ResNet structure, which is famous because it has a sort of bypass layer here. And that's mostly just to do with uh, uh, being able to train it faster. Maybe like the thing that, that you're looking for, it doesn't have to go through all these filters. So you go through a bypass and um, it can propagate directly into, a, into the starting point without having to go through all these layers for training. Um, so it goes through the feature uh, extraction process, and here you can again see the bridge sort of uh, uh, connections here as it goes through the upsampling phase. And the upsampling phase uh, has some additional uh, 
structures in here, the residual convolution unit, which is the exact same as you can see the resonance sort of unit with its bypass here. And but something also very curious is the chain residual pooling design. And what you see here is you see a downsampling pooling uh, layers as well that shrinks the, the resolution. Uh, you might be asking, well, why, why do you want to shrink the resolution at all in the, in the upsampling phase? Well, the reason is that you want to take information from the surrounding area when you're making a judgment call on what to classify. So these downsampling actually squeezes the resolution down, but it can tell you if certain things are present. And hence, for, for, from that perspective, it's actually sort of aggregates uh, the local structure uh, of whatever you're looking at. So enough about the CNN itself. So I'll present some results right now uh, on the CNN sort of, uh, output. So this is what we do is we're predicting on 256 by 256, I believe. We're taking the center 128 by 128, 128, and then we kind of stack them on top of each other to come up with sort of this image. I think it's 896 by 896. And then you, you know, feed it throughout the whole sort of map, uh, as it were. So this is just a small chunk. The training process is run over many batch size of eight scenes per batch, 100 steps per epoch, and 100 epochs. These are sort of uh, uh, just the machine learning terms of how long it takes. It takes roughly six hours um, to go through the whole thing. And you can see from the RGB image to the CNN output to a, something we uh, I use known as the conditional random field. Uh, I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so for the parameters for the training, we use the uh, usual cross-categorical entropy loss. Uh, also something we experimented on focal loss and Lavas loss, which actually is more suitable for class and balance data sets. Uh, for in our case, uh, Sometimes we might have a lot more, you know, deep ocean or terrestrial rather than coral or, or seagrass or something like that. Generator function constantly produces a randomly spectrally shifted training sets during runtime. So we might have one uh, image that has a truth data set, but we randomize uh, the spectral information going into the CNN. So you can generalize over multiple uh, days and multiple different satellite imagery. So, you know, sometimes you might get clouds, you might get, you know, atmospheric disturbance. These are meant to filter it out after you augment the image itself. So post-processing. So we realized at an early stage that uh, the CNN itself actually is very good at coming up with a large scale sort of a general idea of where things are and what things are. But however, when you get into the sort of the minutia of the details that it actually lacks sort of uh, the specific uh, uh, direct resolution that, that you were you're really looking for. So we, what we do is, well, the, the CNN produces a probability map, right? So we take the high probability areas where it, think, it is pretty sure about what a certain class is. And we feed that into a CRF, the conditional random field, and the KNN. So what the conditional random field does at first is actually it's a combination of looking at the probability predicted by the CNN. It combines it with the uh, the, the spectral values or the RGB values in this case of the image, as well as the their distances between each other to come up with a new classification um, as to a new field map or segmentation map on what it thinks it should be. And afterwards, we run it through a KAN, uh, which is just K nearest neighbors. And here is sort of an image of where each uh, in RGB space and HSB space, uh, where each class sort of occupies. And then you can uh, can take this information and reapply it over this sort of general error. And remember, this is only for high probability uh, classifications where the CNN is pretty sure about the classes that it uh, classified. And this is the general result. If you apply the CNN, KNN together uh, onto the RGB image, uh, sorry, the CNN output, you can go from CNN output, the CRF, down to the KNN. You can see that it starts capturing more of the areas that it missed. And then uh, you can take a final CRF of the KN output, but it doesn't really actually add all that much. So this is generally, this is the final output that the uh, NemoNet uh, CNN uh, produces for from the pre-processing, the CNN itself, and the post-processing. Just some more images of randomized uh, elements that you know I took from data sets, you can see the prediction expertly classified. Um, this is another um, architecture of CNN that we, we were trying different architecture the whole time. Um, Sharp mask, uh, deep lab, 
you can read about all of these things. So there, there were tons out there. Uh, and this is what we, our base, our um, CNN is based on something called the refinement. And uh, this is a final result and the confusion matrix uh, for, for our nine class sort of uh, uh, our classification. Well, what we did realize that is that the CNN is very good at picking up wave breaking, uh, particularly good actually. <laughs> um, yeah, go figure. So there's a result. Uh, I think this paper came out in 2019, I believe, or it was written in 2019. Um, so we're going from the RBG, RGB image expertly classified um, all the way up to refine it. And here are kind of the error metrics uh, for for the different uh, things that we played around with. Deep Lab, Sharp Labs. They even tried different loss functions that I talked about a little earlier. Focal loss, Lavas loss. Focal loss kind of uh, focuses on Class of, uh, classes that are difficult to uh, classify or that are particularly challenging. So classes that don't appear a lot. Lavas loss actually uh, maximizes the intersection over union or the chip card index. Um, yeah, and you have your normal cross entropy. And actually it should be weighted cross entropy here for class imbalance. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, super resolution here. I won't particularly go into too much detail as well, but this is also a CNN ability, as far as CNN architecture to take one set of data, uh, one set of satellite imagery, or even, you know, uh, aircraft imagery and upsample it um, so that it can be used inside the CNN that we built earlier. So in our, <laughs> in our early days, uh, we built something like this. You have the low resolution image, it goes through a super resolution, SR set for super resolution CNN, it becomes a high resolution image. It goes through our CNN classifier, and voila, we have an output. Unfortunately, this does not work, uh, <laughs> as we found out painfully. And, and the general idea is because the low resolution image has features, or it's missing features that a, the normal high resolution image has. And these features are not really salient. You can't really see it with the human eye. It all goes into the uh, CNN itself. So what we do is our implementation, It's um, and our CNN, by the way, is something called, uh, based upon the uh, LAP SRN, uh, the Plastian Super Resolution Network. Um, so you take the low resolution image, what you do is actually run it through the CNN, and this is trainable, by the way, but you have an opposing high resolution image that is you know, directly uh, at least aligned with the low resolution image. And you run through a feature-wise extractor. Now the feature-wise extractor comes from the CNN that we built, right? So the feature-wise extractor actually is if you remember the blocks running off of the off of the uh, extractor as the CNN is going as, as it's downsampling, that at every layer you can kind of uh, pull out uh, chunks of it, and that's just, that is where the feature-wise extractor is. And you compare the feature-wise extractor between the super resolution, sorry, super resolution and the high resolution image, so that they match, and you you build a loss out of between these two. Uh, and you have the feature-wise loss, and this is what you try to minimize. As you're mi minimizing the feature-wise loss, um, hopefully the, the low resolution image feature-wise becoming more and more similar than to the higher resolution. And finally, during, afterwards, uh, during runtime, you use the super resolution uh, CNN itself. And then you can run it through this thing and it will, it will do much better. So this is kind of the example. Uh, Worldview Sentinel, this is 10 meter. This is, uh, yeah, 10 meter to two meter. So, you know, roughly four time uh, magnification. This is kind of the limit on um, currently that, that we've been able to achieve. Uh, so you can see Sentinel, it's quite blurry. And the super resolution result. And afterwards, if you sharpen it and run it through the CNN, um, you, you, the accuracy metrics are are much better, yeah, around eighty percent. If you just did it for the high resolution, it's around eighty five percent. So you get within kind of striking distance of the of the original. And what we're doing now is we're actually ingesting all the maps from Living Oceans Foundation, all you know, all sixty five thousand kilometer squares of uh, kilometer squares of data. This is just two particular islands that. Uh, that we did here just for showcasing it. Unfortunately, sometimes the cloud shadows do uh, <laughs> do mess things up a little bit. Uh, uh, so there are certain areas that we're still dealing with, but overall it, it generally gets the, the idea. And this is just all automated going through the CNN. 
uh, filter uh, and the KNN, of course, and post processing. And yeah, so these are just some updates. We have more and more projects uh, coming down the works. You have, we have uh, fuel campaigns as well that generate data to go into the neural net game app. Uh, we have our picogram uh, proposal. So this was really aimed at operationalizing a, a neural net. And finally, Marineverse, which is looking at the biodiversity uh, of the maps that uh, we're going to create. So yeah, uh, it's some of the news articles. I don't know if you'll be able to uh, uh, click on these, but you can go on Google and search neural net news as well. So it's, uh, it's about the same. And some of the publications uh, that's come out of this uh, over the last few years. Um, and yeah, thank you. And uh, I think that's it. So thanks for listening. And I'll, I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Well done, Alan. Right yeah, I kind of <laughs> <laughs> tried to make it as a uh, objective. Here, okay. I've, got, I've got a couple of questions. Sure. <laughs> and the first question is, um, it was really weird that Hawaii, you know, the, the user, I think what, what you call this um, recall mm -hmm. statistics, I suppose it's like um, game player ability was like terrible for Hawaii, but quite good for the other countries. Mm -hmm. um, can you, do you think there's, a, there's anything to say about the property, you know, the properties of Hawaii which go, which could be predicted by the recall statistics. I mean, what, it's not that everyone in Hawaii is a fool. Yeah. <laughs> and a good authority. So why are they going wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, um, the Hawaii data set is something that we actually received from NOAA. Uh, and I think they have something like, they have a lot of classes. And, <laughs> and I think that's particularly the main reason why it, it did so poorly. Just, I think the user resource is utterly confounded. And it's so different from the other data sets that we were training them with. Um, so sometimes when they're, and then when they're thrown this Hawaii data set with, you know, all these things that they haven't seen before, they, they get, you know, utterly confused. Yeah, that, that, that's sort of what I'm driving at. Yeah. Is, is that those recall statistics could actually tell you something about the ecology of a particular site mm -hmm. because you're presenting people with things they haven't seen before. I mean, that is something which maybe distinguishes Hawaii from the other sites on a biodiversity level or uh, yeah, I, I mean, complexity level. I, I think a little careful here because it might not be the ecology itself. It's just also there's so much things tied within like how you're training the user, what you, they're used to, okay. uh, used to seeing. Like we train them on Guam data, right? It's uh, it's a little more straightforward, fewer uh, classes, and and that's like where things that you can trust. So it's. It's a it's, 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 yeah, exactly. It's a bias. It's hard to separate these two um, unless if you really know um, what you're giving the user yeah. and what they're used to seeing as well. Yeah. Uh, it comes with the, the challenges of trying to farm out citizen science data. Yeah. Uh, I think that we're, we're still sort of working on. Yeah. You know, thinking back about that, so obviously, as you get closer to the world triangle, you're going to have much more complex for the ecosystem. Um, I'm assuming that there's going to, is there a different training set for kind of different locations? Because even if you look at, you know, in, in the Atlantic as well, the Caribbean, you're going to have a different training set. Um, how does the ecosystem traits how do you plan on thinking about that? Or? Yeah, so actually uh, on the Nemo Net map, when you go into the game, it lets you select which area you want to classify now. So I think this might have been before you you could select where you wanted to classify. So yeah, so we really split it up now. Okay. So I didn't show the map, but you can, you know, you scroll around and you're like Guam, you click on Guam, and don't only give you Guam data sets. Okay. And then, yeah, so forth, yeah. So I guess only if you're comfortable exactly. analyzing something from Cartagena, you could pick, you know, for example, or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It, it, it really benefits to uh, segregate out the different areas. Okay. It's, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Is there any questions? I've got, I've got another little look up. <laughs> so the accuracies are impressively high, you know, like 85, 86%. But I mean, I'm going to needle you a bit here. There's a mm -hmm. few like no brainer classes. Yes, yeah. Like deep water, clouds, mm -hmm. breaking waves. Yep. 
you know, you're kind of like sneaking them into yeah, the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> and I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, and normally when we assess, um, you know, Mac accuracy, we sort of uh, take those as a given and then we really get into mm. the, the more tricky ones, like the densities of the sequences and the cross and the rubble and what have you. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not going to ask you to sort of oh, okay. reveal it, but I, I think <laughs> it'd be interesting to know how much the accuracy goes down mm -hmm. when you take out those. I think I do have a number for you. It's uh, I think it's around um, seventy percent. Oh, so, okay, so it's, around, it goes down. It goes. It does go down. The re a bit yeah. more than ten percent, but it's still not terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So and this is the main like the big classes. Yeah. Um, I yeah I did do analysis. I do have the uh, the confusion matrix and all of that in the paper, and it will list out everything in accurate detail. Of, yeah. I think it's around seventy five. Yeah. I think if you're comparing with like other yeah. Like mapping initiative through the years, you sort of have to take that maybe. So. Yeah, I've tried to mostly concentrate on like the statistics that you saw, like around areas of coral. So I'm yes. not classifying just, you know, deep ocean. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so it, it's always around the, the areas uh, <laughs> that, that you saw, like uh, where there's at least some coral present. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you, UNet deals with clouds and cloud shadows and Yes, yeah, so we actually have a separate uh, cloud shadowing algorithm. So NemoNet itself, um, it does have its own cloud detector. And, uh, and you saw like the clouds that, that I did predict. But what we do is actually, the less classes that you give it to identify, at least for the CNN, the better it does. So we have another separate cloud detector that only does cloud cloud shadowing. And it's actually very good at detecting the cloud themselves. So it's, it can tell like what is not a cloud, even though it is extremely bright. Like pavement or like the tops of rooftops, wave breaking. It will it will not capture any wave breaking, even though like the in, in terms of you know the if you just look at RGB and it, it looks kind of it's exactly the same values as clouds. So the shape sort of matters, uh, and that's what the CNN filters out. And when you overlay the two masks on top of each other, uh, the cloud mask and the original, you can kind of uh, weed out exactly what the clouds are uh, as you're making your final classification. Yeah, I think the clouds are always a wicked problem. I mean, yes, the it. cloud shadows especially, actually, because sometimes it'll, it'll shade everything and just start, it'll just start thinking it's deep water. Yeah. Because you get no reflectance back. And then, yeah. <laughs> but but as, you, as you further deploy the tool and you have sort of better temporal um, depth of the remote sensing, you can maybe compare between images under the assumption that clouds move. Yes. And um, the shadow, you know, if something changes through time, it's yeah. probably not on the ground. Yeah. So, yeah, right now, I think most of the system is like a sort of a one off. So we don't do yes. like temporal detection between different sort of frames and aligning them as well. And, and there are the systems that, yeah, that, that do that and look at domain trans transfer and things like that. Yeah. Any questions? No. All right then. Um, thank you very much, Alan.